We got a lot of territory to cover with uh, 2023 and the generator interconnection rules, so we want to go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amanda Rumsey, who's going to be our moderator for this panel. Amanda, could you take it away? Thanks, Shelley. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to moderate today's panel on Order 2023. Uh, interconnection reform is a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and um, we are really um, fortunate to have such an esteemed panel and a well-rounded group of panelists who will share their perspectives and insights on the rule today. I hope that we'll have some time for questions at the end. I anticipate that the hour will go very quickly, um, but we'll certainly try to re uh, leave some time for that. Um, as folks will maybe remember, uh, at last year's fall meeting, we had a pre-final rule discussion on interconnection reform and uh, today's discussion should be an excellent follow-up to that. So again, I'm really excited to hear from our panelists and all of your questions. I'm going to quickly introduce today's panel and then I'm going to turn the mic over to Karen who will uh, kick things off with an overview of Order 2023. So with us this morning we have Karen Hertzfeld who is the Senior Transmission Counsel to FERC uh, Commission Chairman Phillips. Uh, who in addition to advising the chair on transmission and interconnection issues has also served in FERC's Office of General Counsel. Next to her, we have uh, Casey Cathy, who is with us from SPP, where he is the Senior Director of Grid Asset Utilization. Casey and his team are responsible for transmission planning, modeling, reliability, and resource adequacy in SPP. Sally Thomas, as the Director of Transmission Planning and Protection at First Energy, where she oversees transmission planning, modeling, protection strategy, and is also responsible for uh, NERC, Reliability First, and PJM, uh, Reliability Standards Compliance. And finally, we have Matthew Crosby with us from Cypress Renewables, who is a solar and battery storage developer. Uh, and he is the Senior Director of Policy and Strategy, focusing on market design, transmission planning, and interconnection. So welcome to all the panelists, and thank you for all sitting in the order that I had your bio. <laughs> uh, that, made it, that made it a lot easier, and um, so we'll get started. I'll turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Amanda, um, and thanks to Larry and Wires for inviting me here to talk about a rule that's um, near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I actually started, uh, was involved in this rule at the NOPER stage at, when I was on the staff level um, as a lead on it and then um, got to bring it, uh, lead it to the finish line uh, in the final rule in the chairman's office. Um, so I'll just, not to belabor it too long, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with it by this point um, and gotten through all 1,500 pages, but I'll just do a really quick high level overview to set the stage for the discussion. Um, so first of all, the commission found that there was a need for this rule, um, that the existing interconnection procedures and agreements were insufficient to ensure that interconnection customers were able to interconnect in a reliable, efficient, transparent, and timely manner. And as we all know, there have been persistent um, and sometimes severe backlogs in uh, all over the country, really uh, few have been spared. And so there's also been a high degree of uncertainty uh, for inter interconnection customers regarding the, the costs of interconnection. And so the commission um, had a lot of comments and commenters overwhelmingly agreed that there was a need for reforming the commission's pro forma, which really hadn't been reformed significantly um, for about 20 years. I think your mic went off. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so the, the rule has three sort of buckets of reforms. The main reform is moving to a first ready, first serve cluster study process. Um, the second bucket is uh, a few things aimed at increasing the speed of processing and then reforms to incorporate technological advancements. Um, so first of all, the commission found that uh, interconnection customers often don't have a lot of information about what their costs are gonna be before they enter the queue. And this is one of the issues that leads to um, withdrawals later at 
um, the sticker shock from the prices and potentially cascading restudies that then delay everyone. So the commission required that transmission providers have a heat map, uh, something that a few RTOs uh, are already doing, uh, basically a visual representation of the capacity that's available at each point of interconnection and an estimate of the impact of adding their generating facility at different points on the grid. Then the main uh, reform, the cluster study process, the, um, a lot of RTOs in particular um, and other transmission providers were already starting to move in this direction, but the commission's pro forma was still uh, sort of stuck in the old days, and so we've moved it over to the new cluster study process. Um, and this cluster study process also includes a built-in restudy period that is triggered uh, when a higher or equally queued interconnection customer withdraws. And so moving to the cluster study process means that we also have to change how network upgrade costs are allocated since they can't be allocated individually to each customer anymore. So the commission included uh, a requirement that these costs be allocated using a proportional impact method or the um, estimated impact of that generator at the point of the system where they're interconnecting. Uh, another important reform were the increased financial commitments and readiness requirements. So a study deposit, one time uh, deposit based on the size of the facility, and then uh, site control. The commission um, is requiring 90% site control to enter the queue and then 100% site control by the facility study stage. And it also provides for a deposit in lieu of site control, but only in certain uh, situations where there are regulatory limitations to obtaining the site control. Uh, commercial readiness deposit will be required before each phase of study and as well as withdrawal penalties that correlate to, to the commercial readiness deposit. And the commission uh, originally had proposed non-financial readiness demonstrations and ultimately uh, decided not to adopt those. Um, the commission also provided a transition process for those transmission providers that haven't already transitioned over to a first ready, first serve cluster process. Uh, but the commission did provide that those who have already transitioned over or are in the middle of a transition do not have to implement this transition process. Um, moving on to the second bucket or the reforms increasing the speed of processing, um, the commission remedied a lack of a standard affected system study process. Uh, and also provided new pro forma affected system study agreements and uh, facilities construction agreements. Another one that I'm sure many of you know well is the study delay penalties. The commission eliminated the reasonable efforts standard or um, the requirement that transmission providers use reasonable efforts to meet study deadlines and instead um, established firm deadlines with financial penalties, but did provide that transmission providers may appeal any of these study delay penalties to the commission. And then finally, the third bucket, um, technological advancements. The commission removed certain barriers uh, to hybrid resources and resources including battery storage technology by allowing more than one facility to share a site and share a single interconnection request and essentially uh, interconnect as if they are one resource because um, for all intents and purposes they are. Uh, another one is uh, requiring the evaluation of alternative transmission technologies. So transmission providers must evaluate whether the following technologies on the screen, I won't list them all, um, could be potentially used um, to reduce costs or enhance reliability, but transmission providers are not required to deploy these only to uh, evaluate in their sole discretion whether they're appropriate. And then finally, there are some um, modeling and ride-through requirements for 
non-synchronous generators aimed at um, ensuring reliability of the grid uh, with the higher integration of inverter-based resources. So that's, um, in a nutshell, the rule. And we rehearing requests were due at the end of August. We have received, um, I believe, 37. Um, <laughs> my last count. Uh, the rule was published September 6th, which means the effective date is uh, next week, I think, November 6th. And we did recently um, issue an order on rehearing um, extending the compliance deadline to April 3rd, 2024, with uh, transmission providers that have WDATs um, in, the, in the CAISO region. Their deadline will be 90 days after CAISO has submitted its uh, compliance filing. So with that, I will end my presentation. Well, thank you, Karen. That was a, a very succinct and I think well done uh, summary of what is a 1,500-page order, as you noted. So now that we've all been refamiliarized with what is in uh, order 2023, I'm going to turn it over to each of our panelists to share their uh, high-level perspectives and takeaways on the order. So you can feel free to go in any order. We can go down the line. I guess we'll start with Casey. Okay. Good morning. I'm not too loud, I'm a little close. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I have to say, it, rather than reading a 1,500-page order, it'd be nice to have your presentation when, <laughs> when it actually <laughs> came out. <laughs> um, let's cut to the chase. Um, so perspective on the order. Uh, so SPP, um, I've been with SPP about 18 years, and wind was somewhat, we had about 1,500 megawatts of wind, and it was somewhat of a, a, a afterthought. We, we had it on the reliability coordination desk, and, and it was just there, and the RCs were sort of annoyed by them taking up uh, you know, additional screen. Fast forward to today, it's our number one resource. The last, in 2022 and 2021, uh, no, 2020 and 2022, it was number one resource. I think coal just uh, was slightly higher than wind in 2021. Um, but it is a, a great resource. You look at the last eight, nine years, we've installed um, 24 gigawatts of wind. We currently have over 33 gigawatts on a 56 gigawatt peaking system. We've hit 88.5% wind serving load. And this is not just instantaneous, it's for, for periods of time. Um, so we've, we've definitely encouraged and worked through a number of these things. So in terms of just the overall perspective, um, you look at 2003 and you look at the GI process 20 years ago, and it was really designed for incremental peakers. It was just really designed for, you know, Omaha had a 1% or a 2% load growth, and you just kind of do your resource planning and, and you go through the queue. It was never designed for a wholesale energy fuel mix change. Um, so you fast forward to today, the queues have obviously been clogged, and we've developed at least three reforms in SPP's territory. And this last reform is working. So we're getting through the backlog. Um, there's, a, there's still a number of challenges with a multi-phase um, cluster study. There's still uh, a lot of the observations that Karen and, and FERC staff has, has kind of noted. That's still happening, where you have some GI customers that maybe didn't do their homework, or maybe they did do their homework, but something else actually changed on the system and you know, they have late stage withdrawals. So in, ter in terms of just the overall need for the order, I think um, that it was necessary. Standardization is, is very positive. One thing that at least we're concerned about in SPP and SPP's members is just the overall approach and ensuring that as we comply with FERC's um, most, uh, I guess, objective for processing, getting out of these you know, overall queues, we ensure that we still have the integrity of the reliability system. One of the problems that we have is transmission takes a long time to build. And so to the extent that you're actually setting up policy that might encourage speed of process of GI, it may be a situation where you end up having a uh, hurry up and wait. Um, we've, we've actually looked at all of the queues and all of the GIAs um, today. So across the United States, and not just FERC jurisdiction, but also including ERCOT. There's over 265 gigawatts of signed GIAs ready to be built that's out of the backlog. It's out, FERC order 2023 wouldn't even help because it's done. So it's a matter of 
yes, there's, there's problems with the queue, but there's also problems with build, there's problems with delay and transmission, there's alignment that actually needs to happen. So in general, we're very supportive of order 2023, but we wanna make sure that as we kind of move forward with some novel approaches, like SPP's working towards consolidated planning process, which is kind of taking the MISO SPP JTIQ and making it a production process, rather than looking at least cost upgrades for GI, we try to optimize, and maybe it costs a little more for GI customers, but ultimately they have a higher capacity factor, more deliverability, the load pays a little bit less, but we actually get more right size transmission. And so we wanna make sure that as we kind of go through that evolution of policy, that 2023 doesn't necessarily get in the way. So that's, that's kind of our perspective. All right, I guess I'll go next here. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sally Thomas. I'm the Director of Transmission Planning Protection at First Energy. And I guess first off, I just want to say thank you to WIRES for this opportunity here to come talk about this very important order. Um, also want to just thank uh, the Commissioner, she had to leave, but uh, to, to thank her for her comments today as well as my fellow panelists. I just wanted to say it's an honor to be with you guys here today. So yeah. look forward to the discussion. So as a transmission owner, and from that perspective here, FERC order 2023 and the resulting changes to the generation interconnection process is really a welcomed improvement here. First Energy, as a member of PJM, um, supported the NOPR. Am I getting echo? I think a I am. A little bit. Okay, let me see if I can bring it down a little bit. Is that a little better? Okay. So First Energy, again, as a member of PGM, we, we thoroughly supported the NOPR, um, as well as PGM's new interconnection process, um, which began actually earlier this year, in July of this year, they moved to their new interconnection process. It really gave its members, including First Energy, kind of a, a jump start, head start here in terms of enacting and implementing this order. So from changes for, from the first ready to first serve uh, cluster study approach to more stringent site control requirements to the implementation of readiness deposits that increase as we go through the uh, study process. I think the order truly emphasizes on the need to eliminate uh, speculative projects and ensure our planners and designers, those critical resources, actually have the time to focus on highly probable new interconnection requests and hopefully unclog the queues that are presently out there. One good example of that here is that at First Energy, in the previous queue process, which is the first come, first serve queue process, 85% of the projects that entered the queue dropped out before the end of it. And it, they dropped out you know, after we had spent considerable time and effort and resources in looking at a number of these projects. So I, as the department that uh, does the majority of the studies here at First Energy, I'm really hopeful here that this order will really serve to limit that and that more projects that enter the queue actually make it to final uh, agreement as well as to Casey's point actually gets constructed out on the grid because that will result in a more reliable and resilient system for all of us. Yeah. I guess if you have to look at the order though again we're, we're very strong proponents of the order we think it's a really good change here for the industry but any potential concerns I, I think the only concern I put it here is just some caution around the penalty that uh, is imposed on transition providers and owners for for study delays. Now, don't get me wrong here. I, I think that uh, there's definitely an importance to making sure that the process gets done in a timely fashion and that each side of the aisle, right, puts enough focus and resources to get that done. But I think that it doesn't really take into consideration the many reasons for those potential delays and ultimately, ultimately may lead to rushed studies um, that may lack the necessary thoroughness and quality that we expect and the customer deserves just to make sure that we don't get penalized. So I guess we'll see how that gets uh, kind of moved through this process, um, but I think that's something that we should revisit, especially the reasonable effort language here that was spoken about earlier. Yeah. Matthew? Great, so thanks and good morning. My name is Matthew Crosby, I'm with Cypress Creek Renewables. Uh, we are a uh, solar and battery storage developer in IPP. Um, I was joking earlier, I don't see a lot of other developers of generation in the room, so I, kind of in the lion's den here, but um, we're looking forward to the conversation. Uh, definitely want to thank FERC staff for the tremendous amount of effort um, in terms of issuing the order in July, um, and we think it's a tremendous step forward for standardization of GI processes and addressing delays. But to uh, really echo Commissioner Clement's point, I think a lot more can be done uh, to address some of the deeper needs for reform. 
Um, Cypress Creek has been very active at FERC uh, because interconnection cost and schedule uncertainty is probably the primary barrier to being able to execute projects and to be able to deliver power on a scheduled basis to, to our off takers. Um, and so it's really important that, that FERC has done this, I think, to, to address some of these costs and some of these risks. Um, some of the key benefits that we see, uh, we agreed and, and supported um, new site control provisions, although we've suggested some improvements. I think the industry uh, could actually take a, a more uh, stringent view of site control and expand it to include interconnection facilities from the generator site, which is what FERC addressed, to the actual point of interconnection. But certainly having a definitive POI um, and improving site control at the generating uh, facility is going to really, I think, improve what we see as first ready projects. Um, secondly, uh, as Karen referenced, um, we are very glad to see that FERC, in its final order, address commercial readiness requirements and, and support those that are aligned with development processes. Um, we were very concerned with what had been proposed, which was to have a signed term sheet or to be selected in an IRP or RFP as a precondition to actually entering the cluster. Um, that obviously would have flipped the development process on its head. It would have been made, made very challenging to sign PPAs without knowing the actual cost to deliver that energy. Uh, and it would have increased the potential for withdrawals further down the, down the line. So I think what was proposed, financial um, uh, milestone payments based on the cost that you cause on the system, was much more appropriate in terms of its alignment with development processes. Um, finally, as a storage developer and storage owner, I think FERC's order does uh, a lot to standardize how energy storage resources should be studied in GI processes. Uh, we see in many markets that those studies are misaligned with how the battery will actually be operated. And so the economic signals that we receive, we would never charge the battery during peak demand system hours because that's when prices are going to be highest. So it's really important, I think, that, that FERC took that step to align uh, study methodologies with the operating profile. Um, Addressing the delays issue, um, and, and Sally and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, um, you know, as a developer, it is very challenging, as I said, to, to finance um, and to ensure delivery dates when we don't have any certainty over when the interconnection study will actually be done. Um, and so having, I think, as, as FERC has done here, um, some measure um, to motivate those processes along faster um, is really important to our business. And I think the facts were compelling. Pre-Q reform, PJM facility studies delivery were roughly 1% on time um, due, uh, based on their, their OAT timelines. Um, and I think those facts, um, honestly, when I, when I think about it, are really driven by a structural problem. The grid was not designed for the volume and the geographic diversity of interconnection requests that Sally's team is facing. And I think that the transmission planning reforms that Commissioner Clements are critical to addressing some of those structural issues that, that have resulted in delays. Finally, I'll just say we, we think it's critical that more can be done. Uh, we strongly agree with Commissioner Clement's concurrence in two sets of holistic reforms. One, better integration of interconnection processes with transmission planning, and two, a much more focused interconnection approach, uh, such as what we see in some markets like ERCOT, uh, which is able to interconnect resources on a much faster timeline and uh, happy to talk about those today. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thanks for that, everyone. Obviously, I'm hearing a lot of support and also uh, maybe some things that are, that are missing, which leads to our next question, which is, are there things in, that are not addressed in the order that, that going forward uh, you think should be addressed by FERC or perhaps another uh, agency? And second is, you know, there's a number of rehearing orders that have been filed, and to the extent that you can, what do you think is the you know, right resolution of, of those rehearing or uh, filings? So we can start. I was going to suggest Go. we start with Matthew Go ahead. so we don't go yeah, sure. in the same order all the time. But feel free to jump in. This can be a casual conversation. No, I'm, I'm happy to. And I'll, and I'll focus a little bit more on the, the focused um, interconnection issue that, that was addressed in Commissioner Clement's concurrence. Um, so I think that is, uh, it can mean several things. We see it as a study approach that would be limited to the power flow impact in the local areas um, and also could include measures to reduce inter interdependency 
of projects, uh, be it in cluster processes or in serial studies. And I think there's a third element, which is that in the study processes themselves, which often can be very, uh, frankly, not transparent um, and are based on study criteria that can be very different, um, I think that the intent would be to reflect the actual operations of the grid in the, uh, in the actual study processes themselves. So using market-based redispatch to manage reliability concerns that are hundreds of miles away from the project, as the market would do via SCED, versus allocating the cost of that, resolving that reliability violation to the project itself. Um, it's really a question of better utilization of the headroom that we have today. Um, we've talked a lot about the need to replace retiring resources rapidly, and we've also talked about the need to uh, build out the transmission system that we need. But I think we can do a better job of, um, of utilizing the headroom that we have today while looking at the more cost-effective regional transmission that we need. Our number one recommendation out of our comments was to look more closely at how GI criteria are uh, implemented across the regions, because in some cases they can be not standardized and not transparent. And so we've recommended that for could hold a technical conference to look at how these study criteria are and aren't, are not standardized. And our view here is that the standardization of these criteria is a precedent condition to actually being able to automate some of these study processes. And so I know SVP has looked at a lot of automation. The processes themselves are extremely labor intensive. They involve a lot of engineering judgment and for good reason. But for the, because they are not standardized, you can't automate a lot of these. And so I think that um, given the significant demand for new interconnection requests, looking at the study criteria and then how that can support increased automation is a critical task uh, for FERC to look at. So um, I think we could all agree if we read through that uh, very long order, there was a lot of comments in there from both sides, right? Um, I, I know PGM or RTO provided a number of comments. I'm sure most of the people on this panel provide a lot of comments. <coughs> But I think as a whole, from a first energy perspective, we were very pleased with what came out of the order. I think between the NOPER and then actually what came out of the order, for the most part, we were um, pretty positive and pretty much in agreement. And we, we really believe here that it's going to help that energy transition and the ultimate move to a decarbonized grid, which is really the, the focus of this current administration. And I think that order, that this order really helps us to move in that direction. In terms of the second part of your question here, I, I guess I'm not quite sure if I'm the best to answer that. Um, it's kind of a, a hard question and kind of sneaky, right, to kind of throw it out there here to us. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, I guess I'll just highlight on, I think there's a gap. There's a gap in the order in terms of the elimination of this reasonable effort language here. And um, I, I think that uh, the penalties that are going to be proposed on the transmission providers and owners, again, time's going to tell in terms of how this is going to be implemented. I think there's some questions as to how that would be best implemented. Um, but uh, I think the, the present language probably needs to be revisited. Again, to make sure that there's proper focus on both sides here to make sure that uh, we're getting through these, uh, these cycles and these requests in a timely fashion. We, we are by no means looking for just an open-ended, open check in terms of, of days and you know, time frame to do this work. But we want to make sure we're putting the necessary time and effort and quality into these requests so that the customer in the end gets what they deserve, right? So um, we, we, I think that some additional focus and some additional, um, I guess, uh, discussion around that reasonable effort language is well warranted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, so. What, what was the first question? Were there issues raised? Um, so I mentioned consolidated planning process um, from an SPP perspective because I think that it, there is at least something that's missing in the order. Maybe it was not necessarily intentional or, or an objective of the order, um, but it doesn't necessarily optimize the overall transmission design. It's, it's really designed to get through the queues faster, which to Sally's point, you know, SPP, we, we, we've kind of had that same type of percentage. For many years, it was around 80% um, withdrawal, maybe not 85%, but it was, it was mm -hmm. close. Um, the last couple of years, it's 60% it's withdrawal, which is still, um, I would be really upset with my son if he came <laughs> home with a 40%, uh, you know, 
acceptance rate. <laughs> I, I would, we'd have a we'd have a chat. Um, so so forty percent is better than twenty percent, but it's still not uh, quite there. We we really need the the, the seriousness in, in going through the entire uh, cluster um, correct. One other. Um, aspect that we felt felt like was kind of missing in the order is the notion of a cap or a cl it doesn't there's not a direct correlation to how large these clusters are we just actually closed our second um, it, uh, cluster 2023 and it was 52 gigawatts again we peak we just peaked in, in the last week of August at 56 gigawatts um, I know MISO is experiencing very similar other ISOs are experiencing very similar types of approaches and that becomes a huge engineering uh, challenge. So I do believe, as we've kind of all mentioned, the, the notion of the order 2023 accelerating GI processes, maybe increasing the ser seriousness of the GI requests through a you know, variety of the study timeframes, decision points, um, and study deposits and so forth, and site control, all of those things will ne uh, lead to a net positive effect, but we still have a problem that we all need to address. And, and my, I know MISO is working on a, on a cap, SPP is kind of talking through a cap, I'm not sure about other ISO RTOs, but some level of, yes, we'll, we'll embrace 2023, but we still need to have some engineering aspect because we're getting inundated with just the volume of requests to be able to study. And it becomes just not just an automation nightmare, a manual nightmare, but you, you don't even have to run a sophisticated power flow and you can just do it by hand and see the highest uh, load and actually load up the prior queued resources, the existing resources, and do it mathematically just on a sheet of paper and know that it fails. It just, it breaks. So you, we just, we have to be able to study these things. We have to be able to address what's actually out there. Now, as, as far as the rehearing, I want to mention two things that SPP uh, brought up in the rehearing. And one, is the notion of uh, ERIS versus NRES, so um, Energy Resource Interconnection Service on Affected System Study. Uh, we do agree that standardizing affected system study, certainly from a customer's pr perspective, is great because when it's not standard, I could put myself in um, you know, the shoes of a developer, that's gotta be confusing. Um, however, if one of the goals, and, and Commissioner Clements mentioned this, is increased interregional transfer, increased in interregional transmission planning, um, by standardizing a ERIS for affected system study, you are identifying far less transmission needs, therefore far less transmission solutions. So any generator, new generator through the interconnection process by having the ERIS threshold, yes, it's standardized, but it's not actually going to increase. It's actually gonna reduce any kind of additional interregional transmission um, solution uh, out there. So we really want to make sure that that's, that's quite clear because that kind of is counterintuitive to the overall objective to actually build more transmission. Um, alternative technology, that's another aspect of rehearing. Um, I think alternative technology is great, but it's just not clear from an order perspective, at least to SPP, that uh, you know, it could be a matrices of types of solutions that we would have to consider. Um, a lot of which we're not even really equipped to be able to kind of analyze. Also, it's burdensome on the transmission owners themselves to come up with cost estimates for every single alternative solution, alternative tech associated with that. And so if, if FERC could, you know, basically through the rehearing process, part of the question is how, how could we so solve that is just make it to where it's flexible so that we can embrace alternative technology, but we don't want to bog down the, the overall study, bog down all the trans transmission owners are already inundated with uh, overall cost estimates and, and so forth in the queue process. So that's another aspect that could be tightened up. Could, could I respond one, real quick? Because it's come up a couple of times in terms of the, the withdrawal rate, because I think it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a serious challenge for the industry. And I think the, the number one reason why that occurs, um, and this is to Commissioner Clement's point, is we still have a system that relies on the generator interconnection process to upgrade the system on a piecemeal basis. There's also the fact that we don't understand what our costs are until we enter the queue, right? And so FERC's moving toward more pre-queue information is helpful, but really what we're still faced with is the lack of, I think, a holistically designed transmission system that looks at future supply needs and incorporates interconnection co costs from that perspective. We might get down to a, a, you know, a system impact study, restudy, where other customers have dropped out and now there's new costs that are identified. Um, and again, if we're relying on the generator interconnection process, 
to represent the bulk of the upgrades of the system, along with local reliability planning needs, that's just going to keep happening. Um, and so we support increased stringency on development. In fact, one of the, uh, you know, and so I don't want to discount the fact that developers can do a better job. One of the issues that we, and to back it up, that we put in for rehearing was to require site control for interconnection facilities, including the Gen Tie line, to the POI. And that's going to reduce the risk that um, changes result in late stage withdrawal later on. Um, I certainly understand that TOs, transmission owners themselves, have uh, time constraints. But having the transmission owner at the scoping meeting, which FERC did not require, I think is another area that we should think about, re FERC should think about rehearing on, because they're going to have information that's critical to those interconnection facilities to actually get to the, the point of interconnection. Um, we definitely would, would appreciate FERC signaling that, that adding generator interconnection facilities to the site control requirements could be a, a really more impactful step than what they've already done so that we can see some of that being considered in compliance efforts um, that are going on right now. Okay, thanks. Um, Karen, I know you're limited in, in what you can speak to here and I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything that, that you can share from the chairman's office as to where there are gaps if, if there's another entity that, that perhaps the chairman's office thinks would be more appropriate to address certain topics than FERC? Yeah, so um, I won't weigh in on the, the pending rehearing request, but I think what I can say is that the chairman himself has noted, you know, this is just one piece of the puzzle. This is not a silver bullet. Um, and, you know, this, this is the, just the first step in our sort of transmission journey. Um, and so, as others have said, another important piece of this is um, the, the long-term regional transmission planning. Because, you know, ultimately, if you have, uh, if you've built out the grid through long-term planning, then interconnection inherently becomes faster and cheaper. Um, I think there's, there were also um, several issues that were raised uh, in the proceeding that were not necessarily within the scope of what the commission had proposed in the NOPER, but could be um, worth exploring, um, as was raised the, the issue of automation, and I know a lot of the, the RTOs are already exploring that themselves of, you know, whether they can, can make some investments that could increase the efficiencies there. Um, and also, as Matthew was saying, you know, we, we got a lot of comments about uh, looking, taking a closer look at um, the study assumptions that are being used, and uh, a lot of people have, or some people have argued for a sort of connect and manage approach. Um, that they argue works really well in places like ERCOT. Um, I think that would be a, a very large uh, overhaul of the way the interconnection system works right now, but uh, it's certainly worth exploring. And I think in particular, one thing that probably needs to be explored is how exactly would something like that work in places um, that have capacity markets, unlike uh, in ERCOT. All right, thank you. Um, so I think that you've touched on my next question and, and some of your answers uh, generally, but more specifically, if you could comment on, on what your thoughts are on what the greatest benefits and what the challenges that, that will come from attempting to, well not attempting, but as we implement Order 2023, um, what are your companies viewing as the, the greatest benefits that will come out of that and as well as challenges? And I think we'll start with Sally this time and, and then we'll go around the horn. It's my turn, huh? Okay, very good. <laughs> So I think uh, there's a lot of benefits associated with this order. Um, you know, one key item is just to focus on eliminating speculative orders or projects here, um, as in, in really ensuring that focus and effort is put on study of highly uh, probable new generation interconnection customers. And again, this is emphasized through increased and more stringent site control uh, requirements, as well as um, the readiness deposits that increase as the customer proceeds through the interconnection process, which really should result in decreasing the number of withdrawals and also um, resulting um, restudies, which takes considerable more time and resources um, to do that work here. 
The other big uh, benefit, I think, is around this first ready, first serve cluster study process. It really seems to be a much more effective, efficient way of doing these studies um, as opposed to the, the first come, first serve um, process that we're, we were presently doing. With the holistic study of these new interconnection customers, I think my mic cut out, just cutting out. Um, so with this holistic kind of review of these, uh, of these interconnection customers and groups, where all the interconnection requests are kind of equally queued and of equal study priority, this should really help us to move towards final interconnection agreement in a much more uh, effective way. In terms of um, maybe some challenges, I, I guess that's the other part of your question here. So I think I, one kind of short-term challenge that I, I see is just with the initial large magnitude of new projects and new interconnection requests that are coming our way, right? In PGM, for instance, we put on hiatus the queue process for about almost two years. And so they've been sitting out there in the queue kind of uh, building up, as well as ultimately here, there's a lot more generation requests that are just coming our way. And that's just part of the system change here. So you know, as a transmission owner, um, we will be you know, transitioning to this new process, learning a new process, on all the while making sure that we're moving through in a, uh, you know, an effective and, and timely way. And so it's just, you know, I think with any new process, with any change like this, you're gonna have some growing pain, some challenges, some maybe bumps in the road here and there. But again, I'm confident this is a very short-term issue, a short-term challenge, especially in PGM, um, which worked very closely with FERC throughout the NOPER and really started their new interconnection process early July of this year. So it really kind of gave us a head start to really jump into transitioning to this order and getting the queue process in a timely fashion. I guess another challenge that I just point out before I turn the mic back over here is that uh, there's probably gonna be some challenges around resources and just ensuring that the proper organizational structure is in place to make sure that all of this is, is successful at a transmission owner perspective. So here at First Energy in our transmission planning department, our engineering design department, as well as our project management department, uh, we have actually made some organizational changes to restructure our teams to have dedicated resources focus on um, successful implementation of this order and um, making sure that these projects proceed through the interconnection process. And this is through augmenting our, both our internal and our external contracted staffing levels. Um, PJM has also augmented their staff as well as they have implemented a new um, public technology tool, which kind of gets to your point earlier here, and it's called the Q Scope tool. And that tool allows prospective generation developers or other users to assess the location of where they ultimately want to connect to the PJM system and kind of see what the impacts may be. So instead of them entering to the queue and trying to get that information from the transmission provider or transmission owner and having us go through those studies as potential perspective or perspective or, or, or yeah, load, then these, generation, these customers could come in and actually do those high level analysis themselves, which helps to cut down on the amount of kind of speculative projects that get put into the queue. So I think between the technology um, improvements that are out there, as well as our staffing augmentation, um, we're gonna be able to hit the ground running here in terms of how we're going to implement this, uh, this order and ultimately get more um, of these projects through the uh, study process and ultimately connect it to the grid. Yeah, I, I think we've touched on site control. And the last thing I, I just wanna say, again, I, I think it's really beneficial to require 90% at entry and then getting to 100% by a facility study, it recognizes that there are some challenges uh, that we might face in terms of right away, other challenges um, that would, would allow us to meet that requirement by the facility study, but not at the, at the earlier point. But in general, as I've said before, I think as generators, we need to continue to impose greater discipline on our efforts and take on more risk earlier in the development process that's gonna benefit everybody because those projects will be more first ready and that will reduce the chance of withdrawals later in the process. And I also think that the commercial readiness, you know, uh, milestone payments based on the costs that we cause on the system are appropriately aligned with that kind of effort to encourage earlier withdrawal through the system, uh, through the process. And so um, we actually supported higher increased uh, uh, percentages of milestone payments. So I think 
FERC, it was like uh, uh, some portion of the, or it was a, to enter, it was a increase in the study cost, and then it goes to 5%, and then 10%. In other markets, we see MISO increasing those costs um, to higher at the front end, and then 10% and 20%. So I think to take on more risk, you have to be willing to, uh, to pay more, right? And to be able to show that you have greater site control ahead of the process. Um, I think in exchange for that, you know, what we like to see, because all of that is readiness on the, gener on the interconnection customer, we think it's reasonable and fair to ask for the utilities to take on actions to be ready themselves. And so it's really encouraging to hear about all the things that your team is doing. So I just, I definitely want to applaud you for that. Um, I, I just want to touch as well on the benefit of uniformity to study practices. So as opposed to allocating the cost within a cluster on proportional capacity basis, doing it on an impact basis using the DFAX method or other method, we think is a, should be the industry standard approach. And we're really glad that FERC took that, that step. But again, there's that additional step around transparency around the study criteria themselves, which NERC criteria are being applied to identify which reliability violation. And is that process adequately considering alternatives to that particular reliability violation? Um, the costs that we pay are based on those study practices that are not transparent to us. And that's why I think there's, there's additional work uh, that needs to be done and a gap there. Final thing I'll say is, again, I really want to praise FERC for looking at the operating parameters of battery storage. Battery storage is critical to meeting our reliability needs. We uh, develop a lot of projects in ERCOT. Um, and as folks saw in the last uh, summer, 2023, where peak reached 80 gigawatts for a number of days, not only did you see 13 gigawatts of solar, which, by the way, had come online in roughly from the point that they submitted the request to actually coming online in roughly two to three years, faster than any other RTO, which helped meet that peak demand. You also saw the increase of rapid, ex rapid expansion of battery storage. And so batteries that can provide that system reliability value should be studied in the way in which they're intended to be operated. Um, we think that they FERC did a lot there, right? But now we're in the compliance phases. And we have to see how the RTOs themselves are gonna adjust their models so that they're not assuming that we're going to be charging our batteries during summer peak. That's not going to happen. And so we have to, we have to be able to implement that at the compliance process as well. Um, last thing I'll say is the other thing FERC did was require the installation of monitoring and control technologies at the battery facility. We actually think that was, frankly, redundant to the types of controls that are already in place through SCADA systems, through SCED. Um, and so ISO New England has actually proposed what we think is a really reasonable approach in their compliance process to rely on SCED to, manager, to manage and monitor battery storage, charging and discharging, um, and to instead of studying the, the battery as charging during summer peak, look at shoulder peak options. I think that's a much more reasonable, reasonable approach that could be replicated in other RTOs. I actually added some thoughts that's the benefit of panel after <laughs> Sally and Matthew uh, spoke so um, some of the benefits I guess from an SPP perspective uh, mentioned earlier is just the general standardization um, rate schedules uh, but also reduction um, and elimination uh, near elimination of the cure period um, for the requests uh, that's something that SPP in particular experiences a lot of churn with um, in the overall processing and, and curing of the original requests in the first place. Um, so those are some benefits. Uh, what Sally mentioned around staffing is pretty interesting because um, it all circles around not only staffing um, at the TO level or staffing at the RTO level, but also our contractors and consultants. So we, we've seen a huge spike in just, I mean, just the sheer volume of our clusters, which therefore means a, a huge spike in overall consulting costs and the overall amount of um, requests and processes that we actually have to have to perform so much so that our own consulting firms are starting to say no and they're starting to say basically they have staffing problems which is really unheard of if you think about the model of, of a consultant 
Um, and so we're actually we're actually starting to have have to you know forcibly we already diversify and, and use a collection of different uh, contractors, but we're having to force forcibly kind of reach out to more you know work with New York ISOs contractors and what they use for because they're a little bit different per region and basically try to. Um, farm out even further further uh, you know efforts and so this kind of ties into a little bit I didn't really want to bring up the penalties associated with it but just in terms of the overall structure and what the order kind of does it standardizes the overall timeline which is con somewhat consistent with what SPP does with a three-phase process anyway so that's fine but when you actually put in penalties associated with maybe it's a problem with a TO or maybe it's a problem with the contractor or maybe it's a problem with SVP staff or maybe it's a combination of a scoping call that was missed and you know the POI, the Gentai wasn't included in the scoping call. I mean, you mentioned that. And then you kind of have this churn, which ultimately you want to make sure you're doing your diligence, um, not only from a reliability study perspective, but, you, but we need supply. Ultimately, you know what I'm I love working as, as an RTO because I'm fuel type agnostic It doesn't matter if it's a battery or solar or a gas plant, but we need supply and you know I didn't want to get on a soapbox for resource adequacy, <laughs> but we're razor thin and that's regardless of the po Political nature or overall societal pressures or overall goals for renewables Even if that wasn't even there we need people to build and so the question is when they actually build and we talk about con uh, connect and manage um, yes Markets can very well establish thermal, connect, connect and manage. They don't establish stability limits. They don't understand subsequent response rates. They don't understand electromagnetic transient response. So there's still this underlying reliability pressure that we have to actually analyze. And so it's just a matter of making sure that as we facilitate FERC Order 2023 and we go through that, that we're not um, rush, rush, rush to, to kind of evaluate what we can and just basically check the box of compliance. And then we end up with a lot of resources that may or not may not have the actual transmission infrastructure. And then, then we have another problem on our hands because then they're complaining about capacity factors and hey, you know, can I have a limited operation study or can we kind of do these other types of studies to be able to increase the, the, the output, which kind of dovetail, it, it's counterintuitive to an actual stand, standard of uh, GI process because then you end up having to study it even further. So I think, that just to summarize, I think Karen mentioned it, but it's it's a matter of if a transmission planning order is, is kind of pending and, and being discussed, and if there needs to be probably an overhaul subsequent of 2023, if that's if that's something that we need to do as a nation is move forward with a connect and, and, and manage approach, they kind of have to work hand in hand so that, it, so that we're making sure that we're really looking at the robust transmission solutions associated with what's necessary to best process all of these GI requests. So. Thanks. Karen, is there anything that... Yeah, I would just um, highlight two things. I think um, some of the, you know, you asked about some of the benefits and I think two parts of the rule probably especially um, impactful. The as far as like best bang for your buck type thing, um, you know, Sally was saying about the Q scoping tool that they're developing in PJM. And so I think this, the heat map requirement, the requirement to provide this information up front to interconnection customers is really important. And, um, you know, one of the probably lesser controversial um, items that still would have a, a, a a large meaningful impact on certainty and costs and really, you know, allowing developers to make the make the informed decision before they're waiting in the queue. Um, and then also, Casey was mentioning uh, earlier that, you know, there's a problem that there are a large amount of megawatts that have signed GIAs and, it, you know, are, are not being developed and I think Commissioner Clements was commenting on this earlier. There's a lot of things that are, you know, outside of FERC's control and most of our control, inflation, supply chain issues, uh, siting issues, which is largely outside of FERC's control. And so um, I think the, the site control requirements and the more stringent uh, commercial readiness deposits, even though they don't completely fix those issues, they will hopefully um, over time lessen the amount of uh, projects that are at the end of the queue not getting developed because 
there's sort of a screening tool to um, screen out those unviable projects earlier on in the process. Right. Well, thank you. And I think we are right on time. That is the end of kind of the, the pre-prepared questions that we had. But I think, Karen, I do want to pull on the thread a little bit of something that you mentioned before we turn it over to the audience for questions is given the large number of projects that have uh, signed interconnection agreements but yet are still not reaching commercial operation, what are, is, are all of your thoughts on how to resolve some of those most pressing issues that are, are really an impediment to um, putting steel in the ground and, and okay um, <laughs> so, uh, um, I was one that brought that up uh, we so we have a couple of initiatives at SPP we actually have uh, delayed um, late notice to construct for transmission that's um, kind of reared its ugly head the last year or two and we've actually noticed so we you know we've had incremental roughly half a, a billion to a billion um, upgrades. So we didn't necessarily have a large uh, tranche one of, of MISO's LRTP, but if you look at the last five years, we've consistently you know, had regional planning processes and projects, but those in, in particular are delayed. So we've e escalated that to one of our corporate risks and, and started basically putting a, a spotlight on the transmission aspects of it, which does embed the GI because we do economic planning. So we look at the GI and we we plug in what we think is going to actually be there five years and 10 years from now. So there, the, that transmission needs to be in lockstep with what we're actually assuming when we study the GI uh, queue itself. Now we're looking at GI delays as well because we were already starting to see um, where we were supposed to be based on commercial operations date this year and last year. Um, there's already some delays in GI. Now what, we, what can we do about that? is kind of yet to be determined. So we're kind of really just at this point, and even earlier this week, we had our quarterly board meeting with SPP and regional state committee with all of our uh, states, and we reviewed this information to basically show them what's actually delayed from a transmission perspective, what's actually delayed in the GI. Transmission, we may have a little bit more control and, and, and pressure on the TOs to either build or give up that project, but when it comes to the GI customer, we just need to understand what is it that they're because we have penalties, pretty hefty penalties, aside from Order 2023, that should encourage them to go ahead and go commercial. But what we're being told, and this is kind of an interesting thought, SPP has some of the lowest uh, rates in the country, um, primarily because we have a lot of wind. Um, but what we're being told is the, the little bit of panels that the developers are actually, the solar panels that they're getting, for instance, solar, um, they're, they're shipping off to other more profitable markets. So in terms of the overall razor thin nature of where we're at resource adequacy wise, not just SVP, but the overall country, it's kind of interesting to think about that we actually need to be sending a higher market uh, pricing signal such that people could actually build regardless of whether or not we actually have uh, lower energy rates. And so that's kind of an interesting thought from what's actually being delayed in GI. And I guess I would add just, uh, uh, and I think the commissioner kind of touched on this here, the, the need for um, maybe more aggressive long-term system planning, um, I think is a true need here to build that margin into our system so that when developers come in and try to connect, they're not having to do as many network upgrades as maybe they would have to um, if we weren't doing that. So obviously that's, uh, that's a balancing act, right? Because you have stakeholders that are saying, you know, don't gold plate the system, but we also need to make sure that we're moving towards a more reliable and resilient system that's capable of meeting the challenges of the future. So I think, you know, so scenario planning that, gov that the commissioner um, identified this morning, as well as just maybe more aggressive uh, load forecasting is something that we're gonna have to look further into um, here as we move forward so that we can build out our system and prepare for what we know is coming, um, but it just may not be there quite yet. Um, I think the other part here is from an actual construction perspective. You know, obviously there's lots of delays out there in terms of long lead time items, supply chain issues and things like that, um, even getting resources in to do the construction, do the project management. So that's something that was an ongoing challenge. I'm not quite sure how we're gonna overcome that at this point, but uh, that's, that's definitely kind of a, a cog in the wheel, at least at this point here, in terms of trying to get uh, additional resources onto the grid. Um, but I think that we all would agree here that getting more generation on the system is going to help the, the long-term strategy to decarbonize the grid, but also to make our, our overall transmission system more resilient and reliable in the future. So it's something we should all be pushing towards. 
Yeah, I'm glad you raised resource challenges that extend beyond the LGIA. Mm -hmm. um, in building the network upgrades, we have projects where it's uh, a simple line tap, and the transmission owner has told us it's four to five years before they can schedule that. And that's just a line tap. That's not any building of any upgrades. Um, but it's just, it's a resourcing issue. It's a scheduling issue. Um, it's also, I think, people have identified in the PJM study uh, a permitting issue. Um, I do frankly think that, again, placing more risk or developers need to take on more risk at the front end of the process and have a clear path to securing all of the permitting and zoning that they need such that they're not relying on suspension at the end of the process that contributes to some of these delays as frequently. And I know my development team may not fully agree with me on that, but that is definitely something that uh, I see as helping to improve the, the overall efficiency and aligned with what FERC has, has said in, in terms of what's first ready. All right, well, thank you. I think we still have a couple minutes for any questions from the audience, and so I will ask um, Drew to help me out if there's anyone has any questions. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Lord! There you go. Uh, <laughs> that was a great discussion. I appreciate it. This is Dave Weaver from Exelon. Um, and, and Matt, I guess I'll target you as the only generation developer representative. But you know, I was encouraged to hear your comments, right? I think we had success in the PGM stakeholder process and in interconnection reform from developers like you that appear to be you know, serious developers that are looking to remove some of the speculative behavior that becomes problematic for right. the serious developers. And so I appreciate your comments around, you know, building up those, those requirements for developers. And, and I also agree with Sally. I think, you know, we, we have to get to a holistic plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think managing the, putting the risk all on the developers through the interconnection process is challenging for us. And particularly, I know First Energy has a lot of Q activity, and a couple of the Exelon co operating companies have a lot of Q activity and represent a lot of PJM's Q activity. So I think, you know, getting to a place where, you know, we can kind of sort of support that risk or redistribute and spread that risk. I mean, I think, you know, what we talked about with offshore wind and what was just announced the other day in New Jersey and what's been announced up in New England is probably part and parcel, right, the challenge around having to build out infrastructure along with those project proposals. Um, so that was just an opportunity to just have some comments and kind of you know, support all the, 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 the arguments that have been made on the panel. But one thing I wanted to ask you, Matthew, is that one of, the, one of the areas that we didn't talk about a lot and one of the challenges that we tend to get into with developers, it tends to be around construction timelines. And so we get a GIA in place, and then the next thing you know, we're not fast enough. And the takeoff agreements are in place and now we're hauled in front of our states with a developer that's supporting a public policy need. And I don't know whether or not, you know, you have a, a perspective on that, that we can appreciate from the other side of the business. Because I find that that tends to be an area that what gets a little bit contentious where I think people don't believe that, you know, we'll get the interconnection agreement signed and then we'll be able to work through whatever obstacles are out there. And then it becomes this revelation that you know, it's really going to take us to build a GIS substation, 230 kV, a number of years to do that. And so I don't know if you have a perspective to share in terms of as developers are approaching and, and signing and executing takeoff agreements against what's happening in the queue process and how you marry those two, those two needs. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And, and thank you, by the way, we were very active in the PJM queue reform process, as I'm sure many were in the room, and, and sought to build kind of a, a coalition uh, to compromise around how to transition in a, in a really um, efficient and effective way. Um, so in terms of, I think, there's, there's two parts to the question. I think one, um, I mean, we certainly supported 845 option to self-build a project substation, right? I mean, that, that is something that we can do. And ideally, um, in a as fast, if not, faster way, as long as those, those projects, substations are met to spec, and there, there's, there's, a, there's, you know, continuity around, you know, the requirements that you have. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, the challenges that we see, um, 
And remind me of the question one more time. I'm sorry. You were, you were... Just, just to take off agreements yeah. and those, what you, you know, when you go in and you execute an agreement, and what, yeah. how that correlates to the process and your thoughts around you know, how long it takes to get the GIX executed and, and construction done. We, always, we find that we're oftentimes in this challenge of, a, of an executed agreement right. and the timelines don't marry up because of the takeoff commitments. Well, I think what I was going to say earlier is some of this could be due to when we actually are able to get enough information from the transmission owner around where the actual point of interconnection actually needs to occur. We've heard that sometimes that that cannot, that, that sometimes the transmission owner may not actually really take the project seriously until we've signed the LGIA, right? And then we're starting to work on where exactly the line comes in and then you're designing those systems, you're, you're designing that. And that's where I think some of the mismatch might occur. If you front load more of that, if you design the actual point of interconnection facilities and where it needs to occur. Is it on this side of the project? Is it on the south end? If you do that earlier on and you require more stringency around site control around those specific facilities, I think you're doing a lot of that work ahead of the time. And I think that's when you can start to marry up some of those mismatches that, that you're talking about. Does that help? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, I know that we are very close to time. I just want to get maybe like a head count from Drew about how many questions we do have. I know. Uh, I have one more here and then possibly, yeah, I think we'll leave it ask your question. That's probably got to be it. Okay. And uh, uh, good, uh, good morning, panel. Thank you. This has been very, very interesting. And I may be going a little bit, um, I should have introduced myself to Julia Freyer with London Economics. Um, I may be going a little bit off topic for this panel, so correct me if I am. But um, we've been talking a lot about um, generator interconnection, the, the, the title of this panel. I'm wondering um, if there's any juxtaposition or uh, I guess comparisons or lessons we can draw or, or concerns you have about large load interconnection as well in, in light of Q problems. Are you seeing that starting to emerge? I've been hearing whispers and I, I kind of want to understand how that fits, because I feel like it might be, even though it's a problem in isolation, and of course, generator interconnection has been um, a reform looking for lots of solutions. If you marry those two, are they self-healing um, self in some ways? Um, I, I'll say yes. Um, we've, we've had hydrolyzers, crypto, we've, uh, something public already is Evergy's uh, Panasonic, Panasonic battery plants, 250 megawatt withdrawal point. Um, so it's a lot of power in a single transmission withdrawal point. Um, it's a little bit different challenge. So our low delivery point additions are, is actually the opposite problem. We, we're, we're very quick in, in, in our members really like that, right? They want an answer because they're kind of, and a lot of even within the RTO itself, their members are competing for similar loads, right? They're competing for these particular industries. Um, and so um, they want a response fast. They, they like that, they enjoy that. The, so the problem that we're actually having with, with SPP in developing the policy is exactly what you're saying with GI and trying to everything that we're talking about, holistic transmission um, development and not just least cost. You don't want to just, oh, you, you have a 400 megawatt hydrolyzer. This is exactly what you need, period, and that's the least cost. We kind of need to look at it all together. So to, that, to your point, that's correct. It's, it's the opposite problem though, we, because in order for us to do that, we have to fold it into our regional planning process, which is, takes a 27 month process for integrated transmission planning, which is you know, not that bad if GI customers can wait and optimize and they actually get a better solution, more deliverability, but it's way worse for members to wait for those particular answers. And so that's kind of what we're trying to trying to navigate. But that is a, a high priority right now because there's so many unconventional loads out there and they do they are large enough to where it's basically the same problem. We just need to make sure that we're capturing that and, and right sizing the transmission. All right, Larry Larry's told me we have time for one more question. So that's I saw Alex's hand first, so great Great, great panel. Um, Alex Stern, Exelon. Um, I, I, I sort of wanted to, to talk about probably not the elephant in the room, but maybe a panther in the room. And I was curious to get your perspective on the DOE roadmap uh, layered on top of, obviously, the RTOs have done a lot on Q reform. 
Then we got Order 2023. Curious what your perspectives on uh, DOE's, you know, weighing in and the significance perhaps we should all take from it or, or um, I, I'll give my opinion first. I, I kind of want to see how Order 2023 goes and, and how our efforts go. Um, but again, I was curious for perspectives of the panel on that. Do you want to go first? Sure, I can go first. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I, I guess just briefly kind of looking through the DOE's uh, comments the other day, it, it does seem like they they try to, they're kind of working in parallel with each other, right? I think the DOE is though trying to expand past maybe the jurisdiction of what FERC may not have jurisdiction over and they're looking for what are the additional, um, I guess, benefits or opportunities that may be out there. So, um, you know, I think for the areas that it parallels, um, it seems like they're trying to work hand in hand. So I think that, uh, again, what we're doing with Order 2023, um, what PGM is doing with their interconnection process, I think it parallels well with what the DOE is trying to do. Um, because we're all underneath that FERC jurisdiction. For entities that are outside the FERC jurisdiction, um, I, I guess we'll see how that kind of uh, works out in the end here in terms of uh, how the DOE is going to move forward with uh, the language within their order. You know, I'd say helpful and complimentary to see kind of the overall direction where the federal government is going. I, I just, my team is solely focused on compliance issues right now, and I'm, I think there's a lot happening. I'm very glad that uh, FERC saved all of our Christmas holidays <laughs> by granting an extension. Um, and uh, there's there's a lot of complex issues that uh, you know I think will now have more time to be resolved. Yeah, I guess um, I assume you're talking. DOE's doing a lot right now, right? So I mean, a, a lot of the different. Um, funding opportunities and so forth, but their national study they just released, we, we had a heavy hand in. Um, it doesn't actually lead to notice to constructs, but we wanna make sure that whenever we do these large efforts and these large scale efforts of what actually a transmission solution needs to be, at least personally, I don't like it to be an academic exercise that just gets, oh, it's nice and it just gets shelved. Um, I hope that it in, better informs FERC policy. So for, you know, it's, it goes hand in hand to where when we actually establish what the needs are and the solutions are as an alternative, then it can kind of bleed into FERC policy and then go back down into the RTO to, to better improve, for instance, the interregional order, whatever that looks like in the transmission planning order. And I'll just say uh, FERC staff is reviewing it. Um, and obviously, like, like other studies, it will be very informative um, to the pending um, proceedings that we have going on, especially the, the long-term regional transmission planning and um, ultimately uh, any action on the interregional front as well. All right, well, before we close the panel, just a big thank you to all of our panelists. It was a great discussion. Thank you.